Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I'm going to start by talking, and then halfway through, uh, Micah will take over. And in addition to us, this is a collaboration. This is joint work with uh, James Skirt. So, um, yeah, I'm going to start by talking about some of the uh, computational infrastructure, and then Micah will talk about more of the modeling. Okay, so the, the broad vision for this work that we're doing is to um, take these ideas from applied from the literature on applied category theory, which are all about um, compositionality, and use that to, to build um, new software for scientific modeling that makes it easier to compose um, scientific models out of other ones. So, all sorts of models in science engineering um, are built out of smaller ones in a sense. I mean, that's really the only way we can understand big models and construct them. But often that's only in sort of an informal sense or it's only sort of in our heads. Um, and usually when you go to implement the model, you just have to write down a really big differential equation or something like that, system of differential equations um, kind of from scratch. And so our goal is to make it easier to assemble complex models like this by actually realizing the ideas from applied category theory and, and software. Um, and so this talk will focus mainly on um, epidemiology models, but we hope that there's a, um, a broader story here as well that can apply to other domains. Okay, so I'm going to start by describing some of the underlying uh, machinery that we use, um, talking about how we implement CSETs and structured cosines of those in CAT lab. And then I'm going to kind of explain um, another way of looking at that from sort of the viewpoint of operas and undirected wiring diagrams. And then after that, Mike is gonna take over and he's gonna talk about uh, Petri nets and, and how those are used to build um, epidemiological models, in this case, a fragment of the coexist model that's been used by the UK government um, to model the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, and so on the, the mathematical parts, of, on some of the mathematical background, I'm gonna go quite fast um, because um, John Baez already introduced some of this material in, in last week's talk. And uh, in any event, many of you are the experts on it anyway. So, okay. So the, where we're gonna start with is an idea familiar to category theorists. So I'm calling it a C set, by which I mean a functor from a small category uh, C into set. Um, category theorists might be more likely to call this a co sheaf but I think this other phrase is a little bit less um, scary to non-category theorists. Um, and uh, we'll see that, um, Building on uh, Cox's work, um, petri nets can be thought of as fitting into this formalism. But um, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to start with a simpler setting. Um, um, in fact, one of the simplest settings, but still one that's actually very useful. So this is uh, graphs. Um, so so, uh, so if you take this category here with two parallel arrows, the C sets. Um, on that category are graphs. And by graphs, I mean graphs in the category theorist sense. So some people would call these directed multigraphs. So they're directed and you can have multiple edges between vertices and self loops. Okay. And so in, in CATLAB, we've built some machinery to deal with um, uh, structures that can be described in, in this way. Um, so uh, I'm going to just sort of uh, uh, sketch this. So um, in our implementation, we actually uh, work with finite sets and even beyond that, we work in the skeleton of spin sets. So, so we always think of um, the sets in a C set, the elements of them as being sort of canonically labeled by integers from one to N. And uh, there are pros and cons to doing it this way, but I think on the whole, it, it makes things um, simpler and it also uh, uh, 
fits well with the underlying machine representation of such things because you can just use arrays to, to track data instead of um, like hash maps or dictionaries. Okay, so if we represent a finite set as just this set of numbers from one to n, then we can represent um, functions as vectors of numbers, integers. And when we store this data, in order to allow uh, fast uh, kind of traversals of the data structure, we also store, you know, what a mathematician would call a pre-image. If you work on databases, you might call it an index, but in any case, it, it can be used to, so that you can quickly find out, for example, like which edges are incident as source or target to a given vertex, okay? And so, so on the right here, we see some sample code showing how you would set that up in CatLab. You define a schema. So here is this a presentation of the category we saw on the previous page, but in code form. And then we can generate a type for this called graph. And then I can add um, different parts to it, vertices and edges. And you can see here that the, the underlying storage is like fairly, fairly simple here. So like the source and target functions are just these vectors of numbers. And so this, this data represents a graph, which is just a directed path of links um, well, a directed path with three vertices. Okay. So a uh, morphism of C sets is, um, is just a natural transformation. That is to say, it's a family of functions indexed by the objects of C that satisfy the, the naturality axioms. And um, categories of C sets are some of the nicest categories you can, you'll ever come across. So they're they're elementary toposes, and sometimes this class of toposes is called a com combinatorial toposes, but it's a very nice class of objects. And so in CatLab, we take advantage of that to implement um, some, but not yet, you know, all of the, the structure that you find in there. So in particular, we have um, machinery for computing um, limits and co-limits, um, both of like particular shapes as well of as well as arbitrary shapes, and we're going to we're going to use all this um, when, to to implement structured cospans of such things. Okay. Um, now there's another aspect of this that um, we need to discuss because often in applications you you don't just have sort of um, these parts as, but you but you also need to have data attached to them that that takes that that's not just an integer. So so you might want to have um, data that's a real number, um, and you, that shows up in all sorts of things. Like you could, if you want to have edge weights on a graph, or most relevant to this talk, uh, rate rate constants on a petri net. And uh, for this, uh, CatLab also supports what we call um, attributed C sets, um, and so that's just the idea of attaching. Uh, you know, data attributes to, to different parts of the C set. And there are different ways you can think about that sort of categorically. The the simplest way is to just say, well, it's it's still just a C set, but we're gonna fix some of the sets to be particular things, like the real numbers. And um, then there's a more sort of explicit way to think about that um, in terms of um, pro functors. And uh, you can find a version of that viewpoint um, in the paper um, algebraic databases by Patrick Schultz and others, um, and we also have a blog post on that if you're interested. But for now, we'll we'll just sort of take this for granted. Okay, so I'm showing on the right here how you define um, uh, a weighted graph. That is to say, a graph with real valued um, weights on the on the edges. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So the only reason to to make a a big deal out of this at all is that usually when you have attributes, you want to deal with the morphisms um, in a different way. So if we're thinking about this in terms of the first perspective as just set value functions, the, na the natural transformations that we want to consider, um, are, are, we usually want them to be the identity on on the, the data attribute objects. and that's, you know, it's kind of like a souped up version of, of a slice category. And, and by analogy to that, um, it, it behaves similarly. So 
um, uh, you can compute co-limits according to the same way as before, which is good because we need to do that. And limits change in this setup, but they still exist, but we don't actually need that here, so I won't, I won't get into that too much. But that's the basic sort of, uh, that's the foundation on which we're, we're building. Okay, so now let's talk about structured co-spans. So I'm gonna do this very briefly because we, we heard about this last week and lots of you know lots about it. Um, so structured co-spans um, are a uh, formalism for modeling open systems um, introduced recently by members of this group. Um, and uh, they're sort of a, uh, a variation on um, something that came before called decorated co-spans, which um, have also been a topic within this group. So, um, and so given the, the data of this functor L from a category A to X, where A is the category that sort of represents the boundary of the open system and X is this is the system itself, a structured code span is a code span of, of the form shown, shown here. Um, so where we think of the two legs as defining inputs and the outputs of the system, and uh, provided that the functor L is well behaved, um, this forms a um, different kind, uh, a category if you take isomorphism classes or, or a double category if you prefer. Okay, and so one thing that, that we emphasize, which is maybe not emphasized quite as much in the literature, is that it, it's useful to think of it's practically useful to think of the two different forms that a structured code band can have uh, when the functor L has a right adjoint, which in practice it usually does. So the, the default form, you might say, is the L form is the one that we've just seen, where the, where the data is a, consists of objects in the category, two objects in the category A, and then, and then a code band in X. But if you have an adjoint, then you can apply that to sort of transplant your co-span into the category A, which is typically simpler than X, and have something in so-called R form, which is much more reminiscent of a decorated co-span. So here, here the data is an object um, in X, and then, and then a co-span in A of, of this form. So you can pass, pass back and forth between these, and this is convenient because, because um, typically what we do is in, in CATLAB will we'll specify the, the structured co span in R form because it requires less data, but then we do all the computing in L form because that's where the, the push outs in, in composition, that's where, that's where it all happens. Okay. Okay, so the structured co spans that we'll consider, uh, many, of, many of them have, have this form um, uh, where you take as your category A just uh, thin set. And so here, here we're not going to worry about attributes, although this extends to attributes in a fairly straightforward way. So let's just talk about C sets for simplicity. So here, the category A is thin set, and um, the category X is C thin set for some small category C. And then what you do is you pick some object in C, uh, which doesn't have any outgoing morphisms. So like, as we'll see shortly, like you might take the, the vertex object in the schema for graphs. Uh, and then you say that the discrete C set functor, given a set, it gives you the, the discrete C set on that set. So in other words, you just have that set at the distinguished object C and everything else is empty. And this, this functor has a right adjoint, which is the forgetful functor back to, to thin set. Um, so most of our examples will fit into this, this setting or a, or a minor very variant setting. Okay, so, so let's say that, it, that an open C set, just to be for brevity, is a structured toe span uh, that is derived from a, a functor L of this form. Okay, so probably the simplest example of this you can do is, to, the simplest interesting example is to take uh, open graphs. So you take this distinguished object C naught to be the, ver the object B standing for vertices, and then you get this functor from thin set to graphs, so the discrete graph functor. And uh, so here it's showing how, so, so CATLAB has built in support for 
structured coastbands that arise in this way. So uh, this is showing how you would you would set it up for graphs. You say, okay, I'm going to get some types here uh, for open C sets where I'm starting with graph and I'm picking the object C, and I get this new set of types. So open graph is the actual uh, structured coastband type, and then there's this other type, open graph ob, or open graph object, which which represents the the things in the 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 objects of that of that category of structured coastbands. Okay, so so here's how we're specifying an open graph in, in the R form. So all I have to do is I have to provide a graph x. So here's, and then I also need to provide two functions um, into this graph. So th this, uh, sorry, into the vertex side of this graph. Um, so this function uh, just picks out the, the vertex one, and, and this other function picks out the vertices three and four. So that, that forms the inputs and the outputs of this open, open graph. Um, um, okay. So uh, open C sets or equivalent classes of, of them form a hypergraph category. And so you can do uh, all, all the all the things that you could normally do in such a category, you can you can do in CatLab too with these things. So probably most Importantly, you can take another open graph like this one, and you can compose it in sequence, um, just, or just compose them. Um, and you can also take uh, their uh, modal product, which is a, a disjoint union. In addition to that, you have identities, ratings, and cups, and caps, and everything else. Okay. So, so this is this is good, um, and th this is um, useful to get started. Um, but but there are some um, um, practical difficulties that, that arise from this, and so I'd like to explain several distinctions that, that come into play here. So um, decorated coast bands or structured coast bands are typically viewed um, as, as categories or as double categories, depending on whether you pass the isomorphism classes. But in any case, all, all of these structures are typically understood um, to, to be two different things. First, first of all, they're they're biased, which is sort of a, a loaded term, um, but but what it it has a technical meaning in this context, which says that the the algebraic structure is defined by primitive operations of fixed fixed arity. So, like rather than saying like I can compose any number of things in sequence, I have a binary operation for composition, and it satisfies um, some laws, associativity laws and stuff, which says that I can do longer compositions and have them be consistent. Um, and in addition to that, ca categories are sort of directed in a, in a basic sense. So there's domains and codomains, and that distinguishes inputs from outputs. Okay, in both of these aspects, uh, they're, they're very convenient mathematically. Okay, so I mean, we like, I mean, everyone here likes categories, and so, and there's a whole lot known about categories, and there's a whole picture of different kinds of structured categories, and so it's always nice to fit into that picture. Um, and bias definitions are convenient mathematically because it's like you reduce um, you reduce the complexity of studying the structure to like a minimal set of operations that generate it. So if you can understand those operations, maybe that's easier than, than um, certainly it's notationally easier. Um, but the disadvantage of this from a computational point of view, biasness leads to the issue that if you want to express a morphism, you have to decompose it yourself. You have to decompose it into these primitive operations. And you can do that by hand. Like you can say, okay, like how would I make this, this uh, string diagram out of you know, um, composition and tensor products and stuff. Um, and, and that is, is tedious and it's easy to make mistakes. Um, or you can do it algorithmically, um, and there's some machinery in CatLab that does do that, but uh, it, it's, it's rather complicated, and it's also kind of slow to, to do all that decomposition. Okay, and then on top of that, when you add directionality into the picture, you not only have to deal with, with the, issues, the, the issues I've just described, but you also have to deal with, the, uh, deal with wire bending, 
is you have to put cups and caps in different places to figure out how to wire everything up. And that just leads to a whole nother level of, of sort of things to worry about. Okay, so, so in practice, what we've found is that it's easier to work in an operatic form of it. Okay, so, so in, in general, the advantage of operads is that they are an unbiased description of, uh, they can be an unbiased description of different categorical structures. Specifically, we work in with the operative undirected wiring diagrams. Um, and so that also deals with the aspect of directionality. Um, so, uh, so these pictures are quite intuitive. Um, they consist of boxes and junctions. So these, so these unfilled circles are, I call them boxes, even though they're not rectangular. And uh, these filled dots are, are junctions. And so, and then typically you would draw sort of an outer box or an outer circle around this whole thing, but our graphic capabilities are a little limited at the moment. So we just draw these as, as dangling wires. Um, and so, so this represents an unbiased, in an unbiased form, a composite of three different morphisms that are joined in a certain way in which also expose certain, certain parts of the domain in the, in the, in the composite morphism. Okay, um, so undirected wiring diagrams are a syntax for composition in hypergraph categories, um, and, and they are the natural unbiased syntax for a whole for a whole lot of things that are out there. So um, by virtue of being hypergraph categories, so, so they're a natural way to express tensor networks to describe um, conjunctive queries and relational databases to describe formulas and regular logic. Um, and and uh, moving closer to, to the topic of this talk, to describe um, composites of multi-spans or multi-cospans, or likewise in the, in the structured case. Okay, so let me, um, uh, so I'm going to have, I'm gonna explain two things. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what undirected wiring diagrams are, and I'm also gonna tell you about structured multi-cospans. Okay, so, uh, uh, a, uh, an undirected wiring diagram can be described as a C set, which has uh, four different kinds of things in it. There are boxes, and every box has some collection of ports, and every port is connected to one junction, in addition to which there are outer ports, and those are also connected, connected to junctions. Um, and, uh, and when you're working in a categorical setting, you typically want to add types to types to everything because those represent objects. So you can also have typed undirected wiring diagrams. Okay. Now a structured code span, a structured multi-code span is this is not a complicated thing, but let me just tell you, it's a it's basically like a structured code span, but it can have a number of legs different than uh, two. So in general you have n legs and uh, the st uh, structured multi code span in L form has has this form. And uh, so structured multi coast bands, or at least if you pass the isomorphism classes, they, they should be algebras of the operat of, of A type undirected wiring diagrams. And, that, and that's how we're going to, to use them. So the, the main thing I need to say is how, so how does an undirected wiring diagram specify a composite of structured multi coast bands? Well, kind of neat. And just read it directly off the diagram. So, so like here's here's an undirected wiring diagram involving three uh, three morphisms. So here we think of as structured multi cospans composed in this way. And so this translates into a diagram in the category X, the form shown here. So what do you do? You basically at every junction you just send out arrows from that junction to all the, the objects that are um, incident to it. And then, and then you take the co-limit of this, of this diagram. Um, and so as, um, so to just to just show a kind of a simple example, just to show that it does work. Um, here's how you would do a ternary composite. So um, as, a, as a single diagram, and then using the graph that I showed before, 
um, you can apply this undirected wiring diagram to, say, the uh, three three graphs with compatible input, three open graphs with compatible inputs and outputs to get this ternary composite. Okay, so I will uh, stop here and turn it over to Micah. I'll let him uh, share his his screen and hopefully there that goes without any tickets. So I'll stop sharing now. Let me just try and get this sharing. Cool. Is this is this visible? Yes. Okay. So building off of what Evan introduced, I'm going to talk about how we've integrated this with modeling petri nets. Um, so to start off, we're going to define the schema for petri nets as described by um, Koch. But we're going to add some attributes to it using this attributed CSET notation to add a little bit more semantic knowledge into the petri nets. So we're going to add um, attributes for um, labels on both of the states and the transitions, as well as an attribute for initial concentrations, which are natural numbers, and then um, an attribute for transition rates, which are positive real numbers. Um, and we refer to these as reaction nets. Um, and to the right, you can see the, the presentation notation um, in CatLab, where we define the object, you define the data type, and then the HOMs and the attribute, attributes there as well. Um, and in CatLab, the morphisms of CSET P3 are natural transformations, but in the co-limits we use for the structured ghost bands, all the morphisms involved are actually um, etal maps as described by Koch, which is pretty important. Um, so moving towards the epidemiology modeling, um, because we're composing very small primitive reactions to build like basic up to complex epidemiology models, we can think about epidemiology models as being constructed of two basic primitives. Um, so there's one primitive where there's a spontaneous change, where one state spontaneously becomes another, um, which can be used to represent something like disease progression or infection, where an infected person um, becomes recovered and moves across from the infected population to the recovered population. Um, and then there's a second primitive operation, um, which I'm calling transmission, which is basically one state causes another state to change. So this basic operation is showing um, an infected, someone from the infected population and someone from the susceptible population interact, and what ends up coming out of this interaction is one infected person and one exposed person. Um, and so this can also be used to describe something like basic infection, where an infected person and successful person interact and two infected people come out. So these three states don't necessarily have to be different. Um, it can result in two infected people coming out as well. Um, and just to touch on the notation here, um, we built a little API around defining these um, to make it easier for defining Petri nets in general. So here are the reaction net. You, the first parameter, you specify the states along with their initial concentration. And then each um, argument after this, you specify each transition in the model. So here we have one transition. It's called recovery. And you give it some transition rate. And then you specify what the transition is. Some I population moves to R population and here. X and I interact, and what you get out is some exposed population and some new infected population. And we can use these to build um, a basic theory of epidemiology, which is like a presentation, and then furthermore to define models within that presentation. So this was talked about a lot in the blog post, um, if everyone has read that, where we define a basic presentation in a free byproduct category that describes epidemiology, where we have five basic objects, a successful population, an exposed population, an infected population, a recovered population, and a, um, a dead population. And then you can specify some basic comms for um, a lot of the basic reactions like infection, um, exposure, illness, recovery, and death. And all of these can be represented as forms of those two basic primitives. Um, and one of the nice things about having this framework built into a full-fledged programming language is we can easily create these using like helper functions to instantiate those basic primitives using different parameters, such as 
different types, different concentrations, and different transition rates. Um, and we use the functor um, function in CatLab to replace each of these primitive operations, like each of these primitive POMs, with the corresponding um, cospan, and then we're able to reconstruct the petri net that the wiring diagram um, defines. So here we're just creating a basic SIR model, which is infection and recovery composed together, and you get this string diagram, and then also um, a petri net representation. And so in the blog post, we mainly focused on directed wiring diagrams and building the models using that. But since then, we have implemented a lot of functionality around this undirected wiring diagram approach um, that has actually made things a lot easier in certain ways. So here I'm showing the same model created using both the directed wiring di diagram approach and the undirected wiring diagram approach. Um, so on the left, we're, we have this syntax called the program syntax, which is basically a simplified way for defining these directed wiring diagrams. Um, that makes it a little bit easier to um, think about composition at O times, where you um, each of the HOMs is um, used almost as like a function in a programming language, and the inputs are provided, and you can like set new wires as variables as the outputs. One thing that comes from this is like when we call illness, for example, where an exposed person comes in and some new infected population comes out, you have to keep track that this wire for infection is not the same as the original infection wire. Um, and then you have to use this bracket notation to tell it to merge. So this is kind of where um, it gets really difficult to work with really complex models because you have to constantly be keeping track of which wires are the same and which wires are different and being able to like merge and split them as necessary. And so with the undirected wire di diagram approach, we can simplify this a little bit with the junctions where the merging and splitting is implied, and we can think of it more as resource sharing. So we have four states here, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered, and we define how those four states are related to each other using multi-cospans. So here, each of these, instead of being um, st like st normal structure cospans with inputs and outputs to legs, each state that is being um, not an input or an output, but just like a, a put, a port on this box is its own leg. And so then we can simply just say exposure is happening and it's connecting the susceptible infected and exposed population. And that's all we need necessary to be able to construct the model. And so it's a little bit simpler to keep track of which wires are the same because they're just sharing resources from the same state. And so we can use this to also really easily build hierarchical models that are hierarchically defined. So going back to the basic SIR model, we can define this using the relation macro um, where we say infection and recovery are happening. And you'll notice here that the resulting petri net is not labeled. And this is because right now we're working with, in this example, normal whole grain petri nets with no labels, concentrations, or transition rates. Um, and this will be explained a little bit more in the next couple of slides as to like why that decision was made um, and a couple of pros and cons with encoding more information into your schema and theory and encoding less. So once we define an operand, we can now use that as a basic primitive operation and define a new relation where we have, say, two SIR models interacting on two different infectious um, populations. So this is representing a dual SIR model where there are two infections involved and they're mutually exclusive. So you can only catch one of the two diseases. And once you recover, you gain a shared immunity for all of the diseases. And this is used a lot in modeling seasonal flu where you have several different strains that are different enough to justify modeling them with unique dynamics, but they're similar enough where if you get one, of, one strain of the flu, you're immune to all the other strains of the flu. Um, and we're able to represent this really easily with petri nets where we say their susceptible and recovered populations are the same, but they have two different infected populations. And the resulting petri net looks as we would expect, where you start in state one, which would be the susceptible, and it splits off in the S2 and S3, which are the two infected states, and then all converge into like the same recovered. And so this is easy to use because 
um, the type checking done in the at relation macro is saying like, oh, I and I too are both infected populations. And so this makes sense. But in the end, we have to add the parameters and the rates post hoc, um, which in this model is really simple to identify, but as the models get really big, it gets really hard. Um, so here they're the same type, but with attributed Z sets, that's not necessarily true because the attributes become part of the type checking. So if you want the infection rate for one disease to be different than the other disease, you need to specify those as two separate. Um, so here would be the same dual SIR interaction as in the reaction network. So here we have to have two separate SIR models that are structur structurally the same, but they're parameter parameterized differently. And because we're in Julia and we can use arbitrary functions to define these um, primitive models, this becomes really easy to implement pragmatically. Um, and allows you to contain a lot more information into your model. So here, it also allows you to type check. Um, you can't cross-contaminate your two infected populations because you're encoding a lot more domain information into the type. So if I tried to call SIR2 with the I population, the initial conditions and the rates for that infection infected population won't match the SIR2 model, and it will like throw a type error and say, this model doesn't make any sense. This makes it really easy for scientists to not only to de de define and describe their models, but it allows the framework to do more domain-specific type checking that you wouldn't normally get if you were just working with, oh, this is a vector of numbers and I want to manipulate it. Um, it also adds the benefit of tracking the racing conditions, initial conditions throughout the construction of the model. So this final model knows all of its initial conditions and rates, and we can very easily output vector fields for generating simulations for a large complex model instead of having to do that postdoc. So moving from that basic introduction, we'll start talking about the code this model, which is an extension of this SCIR model that um, I described before, but is changed a little bit in structure to fully represent what we know about how COVID-19 works. So the main difference is instead of just um, having an infection path from like exposed to infected, there's an asymptomatic path where someone can become asymptomatic and can spread COVID, but they are not necessarily showing um, symptoms and they might be spreading it unknowingly. And so they may have a higher um, exposure rate and then they move to recovered. Um, also, there's two stages of infection, which is based on antibody development. So I1 here represents a strong infection where they have no antibodies and then I2 um, represents when antibodies are starting to form, but you are not quite yet recovered. You're still experiencing symptoms and are ill, um, but it's a weaker illness. And then similar with the recovered states, R1 um, is based off of the beginning of antibody development and you move to R2, which is a stronger recovery where you have more um, antibodies present. Um, and then this model is also a lot more complex where they have these meta states. So inside of each of these health states, you can have different states of like how the person is social distancing, what is their testing, and then what age group they are. And all of those play a role into what transition rate they're seeing throughout the network. Um, so in this example, we're mainly just gonna focus on implementing the basic epidemiology model, as well as um, getting some multi-generational age cross exposure. So to define this model, we can define it using the at relation macro. And these are all the same primitives as we saw before, but a little bit more um, specific. So we have exposure, which is the normal exposure where infected people and susceptible people interact, they produce some exposed population. And then we have exposure for all the different other states that can expose a successful person. So here, the second infected population can expose a successful person as well as the asymptomatic and in their model, they're doing exposed people can expose a successful person, um, as well as encoding all of the asymptomatic um, route, as well as the illness progression and then recovery progression, which is slightly different than SEIR. And so once this is defined, we can get the undirected wiring diagram. Um, as Evan mentioned, with our um, graphics limitations, Graphviz does automatically do the layout um, 
choices with directed wiring diagrams, it's a lot easier for us to like make sure the layout looks really nice. But with GraphViz, it chooses the layout and sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's not. As the models get really complex, it can be a little bit hard to identify whether the diagram looks right from this string diagram um, visualization. But the at relation macro provides a really nice way of looking at the information in a way that is easy for the scientists to understand and makes it a lot easier to define the model um, correctly on the first try because it's closer to them just writing down their assumptions of the model and how they understand the system to work. Instead of having to worry about implementing what differential equation am I doing um, and making sure all of that programmatic um, data structure implementations are correct. And so once we define the model, we can apply the functor on all of these different primitives and we can get the resulting feature net. Um, and this actually looks a lot closer to that original diagram, um, that original unformal diagram from the coexist repository where you can see the successful population moving to expose and then moving across either as asymptomatic to recovery or through an infectious path and then either dying or recovering. Um, and there's a lot of boxes of different exposures, illness, progression, all of that stuff that was defined in the relation macro. So after we've defined the code this model, we need to like extend it to take care of the multiple age groups where each age group can be viewed as having their own code this model with different rates and transitions um, and initial concentration, but each different age group can cross expose any other age group. So we can define this as an, another operad for cross exposure, where it's basically we have two sets of the population um, fair, um, objects, where we have SEI, I2, A, R, R2, and D, and then prime versions of those, which just represent two separate populations. And then there's a set of exposures where the prime population can infect the non-prime population, and then the non-prime population can infect the prime population. Um, and this is, again, just listing off exactly how the scientist thinks about the system and is very easy to um, make sure that they wrote it down correctly the first time. Or if it's wrong, it's very easy to go back and debug this um, block of code. And we end up getting a resulting feature net that looks like this. It looks a little bit weird because we have some states that don't have any transitions at all. Um, technically, we wouldn't have to include this for creating the valid cross exposure model, but by having these states in here, it makes it easier to compose with the normal coexist model. Um, but so these states are the recovered and dead states, and they're kind of just floating there. And then all of these boxes are just all these states in, um, exposing all of the other successful populations. And so if we want to take this cross exposure model as a new primitive and the code this model as a new primitive, we can then create a hierarchical model very quickly for some number of populations going through some cross exposure. Um, and then each population would have their own code this model. So here we do that. So we use this cross exposure one, two is basically saying we have cross exposure for populations one and two. So population one is in exposing population two and vice versa. And then we have a coexist model specific for each of those two populations, and those are parameterized. Um, you might also notice that I'm not splitting up the populations into um, a large set of numbers or a large set of states. This is another great feature of CatLab and this operatic approach because, because they're multi cospans we can always bundle and unbundle wires arbitrarily as long as this, um, the resulting ports still match up with the type. And so here we can take the SEI, I2, A, R, R2, D, and we can say group those together in this wiring diagram and consider them one wire. So in the previous wiring diagram, the wires represented scalars. Here, these are actually representing vectors of scalars. Um, so the vector of state. And so we can just consider this population one, population two, they each have their own coexist model, and then they interact with cross exposure. Um, and then we can use the functor to produce a petri net 
um, which ends up being pretty large, even with just two populations, um, and kind of illustrates feature nets are really good at generating um, simulations and being semantically sound, but they're really hard at defining by hand. So here we have a very large number of states and even larger number of transitions. Um, and that would be very difficult for a scientist to sit down and actually just write down this petri net. But with this compositional framework, we can do it very quickly and easily, and in a way that we know that the resulting petri net is correct. Um, as well as if we did normal whole brain petri nets, it would be very hard to go back and identify which states are which and which transitions are which, and then post hoc applying the transition rates and the initial concentration. So here, as we build the model, we're also keeping track of which states have which concentration and which transitions have which transition rates, um, which is nice. Because then we can automatically use a function to calculate the appropriate vector field um, and then feed that into an ODE solver, for instance, um, in Julia. So this is using the um, differential equations.jl package in Julia. Um, we can use a vector field function that is built into our feature net framework for calculating the vector field for an arbitrary feature net, um, as well as helper functions to get the concentration of all the states and the rates for all the transitions, um, specify a time step or um, a time span, and then plug it into the differential equation solver. And then we can quickly solve and plot the solution and analyze the results. So here we see exponential decay in the beginning with susceptible people and exponential growth in the infected population as more infected people. As there are more infected people, there are more people to infect the susceptible population. So it um, grows and decreases exponentially um, respectively. And then over time, the infected population progresses to this um, second infection state. And then there's recovery. And there is a little bit of death, but it's pretty small and not super visible in this graph. Um, and another nice part about this framework is we've separated the construction of the model with the definition of the primitive reaction. So we've um, the relation macro captures the structure of building the model. And the primitive reactions um, store what each of those reactions should look like. So it's very easy to redefine those primitive reactions with new transition rates and initial conditions and be able to quickly create new versions of the same model with different parameters. So here, we are decreasing the exposure rate to um, represent um, government policy implementation of like social distancing mandating. And we can see that the curve flattens slightly and um, shifts to the right in time. So we're delaying the peak and flattening the peak as well. Um, you might notice that the, the total infected and recovered don't change due to the fact that our model doesn't support any sort of um, immunity, such as vaccination. Um, but based on the framework, it would be really easy to add something like that. And then we would be able to tweak and adjust the vaccination rate to also model if more people got vaccinated, how would that affect the total number of infected? Um, and with the original coexist model, they had a lot more space for stuff like social distancing status and um, testing. If we encoded that into the model, we would also be able to build a more accurate representation of COVID. And also, it would change the semantics of what it means to um, apply policy. So here, we're simply decreasing the exposure rate and saying that that represents a change in social distancing where if we encoded the social distancing into the structure of the model, the semantics of acting that policy would then shift from exposure rate changing to changing the rate of social distancing um, as a structural change, um, which allows you to um, switch between where the abstraction happens and the definition of the model and where changes apply. Um, so overall, in, or in conclusion, um, ACT provides a really nice framework for defining these um, model very quickly and easily, um, and then manipulating them. Um, but to get there, we also have to implement all of the math um, in CatLab. That is all I have. Evan, if you have any conclusions you could like to make as well.
Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that that's it. Yeah. So, and yeah, just to, re to reiterate, I mean, I think that the epidemiology is a really nice setting to explore compositional scientific modeling uh, because it's uh, topical and also people have uh, in this group have worked on, you know, the uh, underlying mathematics of that. Um, and But I hope we'll be able to uh, spin these sorts of ideas to other domains and, and other types of models as well. So um, thanks everyone for, for listening. Great. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Yeah, I have a quick question. So I have a question about sort of how the equations scale. Um, so does it take a long time to, to solve these equations and, and how quickly does it become unfeasible to solve them as the size of these Petri nets go up? Um, it scales really well because calculating the vector field is very quick um, because you can do it basically using matrix math, um, which is very highly researched and pretty optimized. Um, and the ODE solver in Julia is also very optimized. So it scales really well. We have not reached a point where it has caused any, any issues. What if you had maybe like a couple hundred nodes? Do you think that would be okay? I guess I could try that myself and see how. It yeah, I have I have generated feature nets with upwards of like 250 nodes, um, and have not experienced any any sort of decrease oh, in, wow, in performance. I uh, I Thank might you. have missed. Uh, how did you model social distancing? So in the resulting, or I'll just go back to, if we're looking at just the SEIR model, we have a transition for exposure where two success, or an, a successful person and an infected person interact and produce an exposed person. Um, by adjusting that rate of exposure, you can um, represent social distancing. So if people are social distancing, the rate of exposure between the infected population and the successful population will decrease. Um, yeah. And so we're, we're doing that um, as kind of like this is representative of social distancing, where if we had encoded the model to represent social distancing as a state, we would be able to change it a little bit more. Um, uh, what's the word? Like more directly. Mm-hmm. But you, you would need to use some external method to get an estimation of how much social distancing was limiting exposure yeah. and then just adjust the parameter. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question. I have a lot of questions, but I have a question that goes well with this slide right here. So in the picture at left, you have the directed graph so that you know, for example, that a susceptible and an infected come in and exposed goes out. In the picture on the right, there's that directional information isn't missing. And so I'm a little confused about if you take the approach at right, how do you, uh, it's, where, where does that directional information get put in? Um, so on the right, it's encoded in the specification of the order of the legs. So when you specify the open, um, like the multi-code span, you just specify the order there. And that order is maintained throughout the rest of the definition. So I could have switched um, these two legs and had it as S, E, and I, but just the domain scientists would have built their primitives and then use them as they define them. Uh, I'm still confused. So, so, so I mean, when you when you try to run the differential equation starting from this model, the differential equation needs to know that 
the two susceptible and infected are coming in and exposed is coming out. And I'm just wondering like where in your, where in the yeah, framework so, do you stick that info in? So here you answered me, we're but defining, I didn't get it. So here we're defining um, basically a relationship between the states. So here there is some exposure relationship between these three states. Mm -hmm. And the primitive that it's defining is something closer to this bottom Petri net. And so the directedness actually comes from the Petri net that you get after you apply the functor from the undirected wiring diagram to the Petri net. And so here you get the directedness of an infected person goes in, a susceptible person comes in, and then an exposed and an infected person come out. And we calculate the vector field based off of the resulting Petri net. So you have to tell it somewhere that exposure is an example of transmission or gets mapped so, to a transition. Yeah. Maybe I can say it a different way. It's like the undirected wiring diagram is like a, a template for the composition that we want to do, but the the directionality of like the transitions in the Petri net come from the multi coast bands that we're going to plug in essentially to this diagram. So like in this undirected wiring diagram, we're just saying like at an abstract level, how, how does everything hook up? But what actually determines which directions the transition inputs and outputs go comes from what you plug in. Um, if, I, if I can add, there's something we struggled with a long time. Uh, the diagram on the left on this slide is a hum in the hypergraph category of gluing the Petri nets together. It's not a HOM in the SMC presented by that Petri net. It kind of, this example, <clears throat> this example kind of works as both. Um, and so it's, it's kind of confusing. Um, there, right, but like this is a, ref, a recipe for composing Petri nets together, not a description of a process that happens on the Petri net. And that, that confused us for, uh, <laughs> A long time. <laughs> uh -huh. And then another thing I was, I still am confused, but I guess it's okay. Um, uh, another thing that confused me is that you, somewhere along the line, I think uh, Evan was the one who briefly mentioned, maybe it was me, like uh, uh, mentioned about uh, categories with byproducts or something like that. And they seem to appear and then disappear. Uh, well, there was some code like pseudo code or code that had categories like with that, byproducts in it. Yeah, I think he's referring to the presentation of the epi. Uh, that sounds right. I remember the word epi in there, which I don't know if that means epidemic or epimorphism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I didn't get. It should just be free hypergraph category. Yeah, it, it should be free hypergraph category. That's just a typo on this line. <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah, I'm, so I'm a little confused because you, I, there's stuff with going on with Petri nets. There's. Yeah, there's. So, so, so there are you could think of a Petri net as a way of presenting a. <laughs> a, a symmetric monoidal category, but then there's also a hypergraph category with open Petri nets as morphisms. Right. So there are three levels here, and it is confusing. <laughs> so, so there, there's at the most abstract level, there are wiring diagrams, and uh, those originally for us were directed. We've now switched to undirected mainly. These just serve to describe how the structured coast bands or multi coast bands will compose without mm -hmm. any reference to petri nets. Mm -hmm. Then there are the actual open petri nets themselves, which are composed according to these wiring diagrams. And then finally, mm -hmm. those get translated into dynamical systems in the form of ODE. And so, like this, this code here is describing something that happens at the at the first level, at the highest level of abstraction. It's saying, here are some generating morphisms in some, uh, you know, 
hypergraph category that we're, that we're going to use just in order to specify a composite. And we're going to plug in for those open p nets. So you're, OK, that helps. So here you said that your top level, you were going to use uh, undirected wiring diagrams, right? You, the, your top, you gave three levels. Yeah, the first so, level so was the wiring diagram. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then this epi thing looked like it was directed in the sense that you were like describing morphisms from a tensor product to another object. That's, that's right. And, and that gets to this point that I was making about how like in the, the directed approach, like for each of your open petri nets, you kind of have to partition the the, the interface of, of the system into inputs and outputs. Right. And that's kind of what's happening in that presentation. And in some cases, it's intuitive. Like it's intuitive to say that like that like exposures to input to illness and infected is the output. But in some cases, it's it's not really, and it's actually confusing it suggests a directionality that isn't there. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we think that um, the undirected wiring diagrams are actually easier to understand in some settings. So. But why did you get bring the hype? Uh, could we go back to that slide? There was a slide that said hype, that one. So like, uh, so there's something directed is going on in the sense that infection yeah. is going from this to that. And I don't get what this stuff has to do with like wiring diagrams. Is this supposed to be connected? Is this bit just stuff supposed to be connected to wiring diagrams? Or is this connected? Um, yeah, to... <laughs> it's, it's basically defining the, the primitives that will make up the directed wiring diagrams. So like- Oh, okay. So a, here you're doing a... directed wire. Okay. So yeah, that was part of- Yeah. One thing that's confusing is that we're showing directed and undirected at once. Maybe we should have done them completely separately, but but everything on, on this side is for directed wiring diagrams. Okay. So is the idea that you first started doing a bunch of stuff with directed ones and then you sort of changed your mind and decided that undirected ones- That's could, right. Yeah. That's right. That. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. No, that's fine. I just tried to keep these kind of okay. There's a lot concepts of going stream. on and it is uh -huh. confusing. Yeah, well, it's definitely good to experiment with things. I have another completely different type of question, which is, sure. so like this stuff is great. So have you, so who are you planning to, to show it to you? So of course, to us, you're sort of preaching to the choir. You, you, you already know it's great. We just want to know more details about it. It seems like, could you, have you considered like showing it to epidemiologists or something like that? Someone like that, like someone who might use it. Yeah, so the the funding for this work actually was not intended specifically for category theory of research. It was mainly for rapid um, modeling of epidemiology um, and emerging pandemics is kind of what it's moved to, um, given the current uh -huh. COVID situation. Um, and so we kind of landed on category theory as a way to solve that problem. Like using these open systems, we can easily build models at, in terms of like the domain knowledge, um, which to us, we think is like the right way of doing it. It allows scientists to define um, basically the model space of um, what they're interested in. So here we have infection exposure, illness, recovery, and death, and all of the models we can make with that are valid epidemiology models. If, if the model composes and you get a petri net out, that is a valid epidemiology model. It might not be the epidemiology model you want, but it's, it's a valid one. Um, and it makes it easy to debug um, by just looking at what domain um, interactions did we choose and where did I go wrong with writing it down the first time. Um, so we're try trying to propose it like that to epidemiologists as like, instead of um, worrying about what algorithm am I implementing this model in? Um, did I mess up my step of Euler's when coding the solver? Um, proposing it as define your domain topics, build the model compositionally, um, 
we aren't necessarily telling them that this is category theory. Um, right. Kind of just saying, oh, pick your pieces, put the pieces together, get epidemiology is kind of how we're selling it. So, sorry, I, I have a question. Um, so this, like in a like in a nutshell, is a bona fide tool for an epidemiologist in this case to to use to guarantee that they can do rapid prototyping of their model is uh, and like it's actually it's actually something more than a mathematical curiosity. It's actually effective programming hard or programming tools that will uh, that can be put into use by domain researchers. Yeah, so that, that's the main goal of the research. And Cat Lab provides a really nice tool, not only for epidemiology, but for integrating other types of modeling frameworks as well. So here I'm doing epidemiology. We also have other work that's going into um, generating PDE systems um, for physics and modeling stuff like diffusion networks um, or model, modeling um, enzyme kinetics in biology is another route we're going down and exploring. And all of it leans really well into this compositional framework where you build this big network of composition, solve the composition and get some model out. Great, so yeah, I was curious how you were going to, a bit more of the details of how you're going to sell it to epidemiologists, but the fact that you've been funded in order, your funding is to solve an epidemiological modeling problem means that whoever gave you that money is gonna sort of pressure you to actually uh, <laughs> show it to the epidemiologist. That is the job isn't done until at least a few of them learn this, learn how to use this tool. So I assume that yeah. part of the problem then becomes like get, getting a hold of epidemiologists and showing them that this, that this tool works mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, the main, the main functionality we're kind of pitching and the algebraic petri net mod um, package that we have for Julia comes with this pre pre built where you have the idea is you have some domain scientists that also know category theory that can write down all the primitives like define what the theory or model space is for that scientific domain and then the other people that might not know category theory can use something like this at relation macro really easily and just say like, oh, there's exposure happening, there's illness and there's recovery. You don't necessarily need to know category theory to understand why this makes sense and you can quickly get modeled. And so we have this epidemiology package built um, as a module in the feature net package where you can just import it and use these primitives that are pre-built without having to worry about making them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just have documentation that explains what are the legs um, and a couple examples of how the relation macro is. So building a model like this becomes really easy even if you don't know category theory exactly. You can say, oh, I made an SIR model. Now I want to put two SIR models together with two different infection populations. Yeah, right. So I guess yeah, the point is you don't have to know what a structured co-spanned is, <laughs> co is, at least if you can work with the the like generators that are provided by the, the package. Um, right. Yeah, no, that's much as I would wish everyone in the world knew what a structured co-span <laughs> is, it's it's really important to not one day need need that knowledge. And and part of what's so great about this is that it's supposed to become very simple when it <laughs> at, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also kind of hard to explain to computer scientists where you're like, oh, we built this compositional framework and you just put the states together and they're like, but that's easy. You just say the states are the same in the program code. And we're like, but there is deeper math going on in the, <laughs> in the package to make that happen. That is not necessarily trivial when you scale up to more complex systems. Right, it's the scaling issue that separates out the different approaches for solving the problem. Uh -huh.